This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another beautiful morning here in Juma Private Game Reserve where the sun is up and the elephant magic abounds. We've got a small little breeding herd here, three feeding in the dawn. A female with her sub adult and little youngster. And hello everybody, my name is Steve, joined by Owen on camera, and as always, we are very excited to have you with us. Now, our plans this morning are to scratch around and see what we can find, and we found some elephants, so we're always very excited to find them. As you know, I enjoy spending time with these beautiful creatures, and it is 18 degrees Celsius, 64 degrees Fahrenheit, and if you have any questions or comments this morning, please do feel free to send them through using the hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter at FC on YouTube, and if you're under the age of 18, get your parents to send through an email to kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. Alternatively, you can also register on the website, head over to the live safari page, and submit your questions there. This morning, it's myself and Owen out, as well as Chris with Darren on Juma, and then we're gonna have Mike and Craig joining us from Pridens. So I'm just going to let you sit for a moment and allow the dawn chorus to wash over you while we spend a few moments with these elephants. We can learn so much from elephant. They're caring in parenting. Now that youngster, for the first two, three years, is even four years, is right by mum's side. First two years is mainly for, for the milk, but it learns a lot on what plants are eaten, how they're eaten, when they're eaten. And I have no doubt they're told exactly what they're for. Now we know that uh, there's a lot of medicine in the vegetation and I've used the analogy before that if you plant medicinal plants in a garden where you have free range chickens, they will self-medicate. Plants like African wormwood, artemisia, they will self-medicate themselves. So elephants from a young age learn the ways of the wild from mum. She'll feed on something and drop it, the youngsters will pick it up, and then that learned knowledge through the smell of what that plant is, together with a little tidbit of what it's for, is then stored in their massive brain. A memory that they will one day pass on to their daughters and sons. Elephants don't eat anything, they're not taught to eat. Mmm, <clears throat> Wakisha's a beautiful sunrise, isn't it? Very peaceful. Virgil's kukul's calling in the background, the Swainson's spur fowl. <sighs> so how is everybody doing out there today? I invite all of you to just take a deep breath in. <sighs> Let it out. Do that a couple more times. 
promise you, if you aren't feeling 100%, you'll feel a lot better. If ever you are feeling a little bit funny, just take a few deep, conscious breaths. There's a little sub-adult male on the right there. Oh, James Richards, my absolute pleasure sharing these moments with you. You've probably noticed in the past and once again this morning that I rather enjoy them myself. Nature speaks to us all, I believe. If we only have the patience to stop. We're always so busy, aren't we? The last few years I've become very in touch with the signs of nature and how they speak to me and sometimes we get so caught up in our head and our thoughts. If you feel yourself getting caught up, just stop, take a few deep breaths and just observe the trees, listen to the birds, watch the animals if there are any. And that's just how relaxing that all makes you feel. Okay, well it looks like it's going to be a beautiful day here in Juma, but let's go have a look at the weather across both properties. It sounds like Steve has started off quite quite nicely. Now, our plan this morning is twofold. We are hoping to follow up on last night's brief visual on uh, the hyena den, and we, either after that, we'll probably go and try and see if we can't find any lions. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris, and with me today on Cam Ops is Darren, and we are on Wendy. And we're right here at Twin Dams at the moment, and it's very close to the Ihina Den. And we just scanning around. We know that at this time of morning, a lot of the adult hyenas are starting to return to the cubs. And we're just hoping to have a glimpse of one or two of them before we head back to the den site to follow up. And in fact, I just saw some movement up ahead. I just saw something move, and it might be one of those hyenas now just approaching from the west of the dam. I definitely saw some movement there. It's 12 o'clock, right? Yeah, 12 o'clock. Okay. And then after that, depending on what transpires, there we go. returning from their night's hunting activity or scavenging. And as we know, they're both hunters and scavengers. So nice that they can pop in for a little drink.
I can see another third one there now. <clears throat> Just slowly approaching. Mm. Hi, Michael. Um, thanks for the comment there. And uh, always nice to to get to know these animals. And obviously, <clears throat> I'm still relatively new to wild earth, and it's a big learning curve for me as well. So with the hyenas and quite a few of the other characters elsewhere. I am going to rely quite a lot on some of our long-time viewers to assist in identifying some of these characters. And, you know, it's a bit of fun, you know? Yeah. Such a lovely scene, that amazing crisp morning light on them, it's just... It just illuminates them, and it's just such a nice scene. Seems like they are disappearing back, obviously, into the woods. So we'll, once we lose visual on them, we'll probably go and just investigate the den site if there's any movement there. The reason I decided to buy a ticket to Dream is I really want to experience what you guys experience. See what Lauren sees. Sees what. BKCs. If you want to go on safari with a Wild Earth guide whilst honing your bush knowledge and of course featuring in one of our shows, then head over to our website. My favourite part about Wild Earth is probably the escape. Just to spend the time pretending you're in the wild and being on those vehicles just removes you from reality for a little while. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could be making your first ever on-screen appearance. My favourite part about today has to be to meet Marie's. To see him, obviously... Oh, amazing! But to meet Marie's was amazing. Yawning and just pretending not to see the Ellie. It's beaten my expectations by a mile. For many years, Wild Earth has taken viewers from around the world to the Mara Triangle, a place of majestic beauty and abundant wildlife. But it wasn't always like this. Before 2001, it was infested with poachers. Illegal harvesting and hunting was rife. Now the situation couldn't be more different. The hard work and dedication of the Mara Conservancy has revolutionized this magical land. But now, the loss of revenue from tourism has created a grave crisis. The Mara Conservancy needs help if they are to continue protecting the reserve and supporting the local communities whose livelihood depend on its survival. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth. 
daily. Welcome. of elephants that are sort of following the first three. There's a big girl on the right, a grandmother. She looks like she might be pregnant. She's uh, quite round, or should I say she's glowing. Yes, that's the right word, isn't it, Owen? She's glowing. So we talk about lessons. We talk about how can nature talk to us. And elephants are always sort of on the move, but they're never busy. They're never too busy. We find ourselves often in, in life frenetically moving between one task to another. Sometimes we even find ourselves so busy with that task, we're very unaware of what we're doing. We stand in our house, start spinning, and then not actually ever achieving anything correctly because we're so caught up with what we need to do next that we forget what we're doing right now. So elephants are a very good reminder that when you are busy feeding or doing a task, do so. Do it mindfully. Do it with your feet grounded on the ground and your posture straight and be aware of the movement of your hands. The freneticness with which we live our lives can often cause us so much stress because we don't end up doing those individual tasks properly. While we are doing them, we also find ourselves not breathing properly. That leads to a bit of anxiety and once there's anxiety, the body is overwhelmed and we stress. Combine that with possibly too much coffee and a little bit too, and not too much water. We find ourselves getting anxious and cranky and then the whole day is really quite spoiled. But if from the moment you wake up in the morning, the walking towards the kettle or towards wherever it is you get out of bed, just be mindful of the steps you take. Get up a few minutes early. If it takes you time to get ready in the morning, just get up a little bit earlier so that there's no rush. So when you walk to the kettle or to the kitchen, do so mindfully. And while you're walking, be aware that you're walking. You're not already in the kitchen or you're not already in the shower. And when you're in the shower, be in the shower. Don't think of the coffee you need to make or the meeting or the phone call or the place you have to go to because that is the future. Feel the water on the body, feel the soap. Enjoy the shower with your feet firmly planted on the ground like this elephant. And once you've finished the shower, use the towel and feel the towel as it dries your body. Breathe into it. And when you brush your teeth, be aware that you are actually brushing your teeth. You aren't already in a meeting or already driving to work. You are brushing your teeth. Those are very simple lessons that can really add huge amounts of time to your day and also bring you so into the moment that when important thoughts pop up, you're able to acknowledge them as important thoughts and not nonsense. Our head is so filled with noise that through meditation and mindfulness, we're able to block out that white noise. We're able to block out all of that stuff that prevents us from being in the moment and when the mind is clear, profound thoughts come to us and then we're able to action them. I'm not saying don't think about anything at all. It's impossible to completely blank your mind, but don't allow little things to cause you to run around and spin. Because once you start spinning, it's a snowballing effect. You never see elephants spinning. There she is, one leaf. Now she's moving it to... She's grabbing it, reaching, moving it to the mouth. Now she's chewing. And once she stops chewing, she swallows. That is about as simple as it can be. And by being aware of that in your day-to-day -day activity will really calm you down. 
We live in a world of frenetic pace and of getting things done. But do we do anything properly? We can only really do things properly if we're present. Try sitting with a friend at lunch or a partner or a colleague or whatever it might be and actually being aware of exactly what it is is happening in that conversation with a meal. Stop trying to be somewhere else. Be right there. Feel the chair against your bottom. Feel your feet on the floor. Feel your hands on the cutlery and move the food slowly to your mouth. Don't eat too quickly. Chew nice and slowly and enjoy the swallow before you prepare for the next bite. That's what life's all about, is enjoy the bite you're currently eating. The next one might never come. Jojo, 100% elephants feed on medicinal plants. I think I said in the earlier segment that chickens will self-medicate and I don't think anyone out there's really gone and thought too hard and thought that chickens are the most intelligent animal in the world, but animals have got intelligence to them. But we all know that elephants are incredibly intelligent and um, basically that youngster is a little bit older now, but for years it's followed mum around and she's feeding on what I think is jackalberry. No, it's a large fruited bush willow. And so the youngster will be like, Mum, I've got a tummy pain. And so Mum will be like, come on, you feel this root here that I'm digging up from the ground? This will help you with that gas that you have. So most certainly they know the medicine. Obviously there's a lot of nutrients in the plants that they feed on. But uh, elephants will specifically go and feed on trees in times of year when there's abundant grass. You think to yourself, why would they do that? Grass doesn't have too much medicine. Grass is uh, quite nitrogen rich, and it's got nutrients to it, but most grasses aren't really well known. That we, the grazing type, obviously, grass is the number one food source in the world for humans because of all the grains that we eat and pulses. But um, elephants will specifically go and feed on certain trees, the bark and the roots, at times of year when they're feeding necessary. For example, many of the female elephants are going to be dropping their calves in the next few weeks, months, sort of in the, the summer months, and you'll notice many of them will be destroying the uh, silver cluster leaf trees, which for humans have got lots of female fertility sort of um, healing properties. And so pregnant females feed on what I find to be a very distasteful tree, they feed on it um, quite heavily to assist in the reproductive system, to assist in the, the birthing of the youngsters. TVPS Primary School in Australia, good morning, or it's probably good afternoon to you. You want to know why elephants have tusks? Well, the tusks are a very important element for a number of things. First of all, the males use them for fighting and competition for females, but then the males are much bigger than the females, and hence their tusks are also much bigger. And the females use them as digging and cutting tools. So. Um, on the left over here, we've actually got a tree that management has put some wire on to protect against um, exactly what elephants have done to it. Now you can see that ripping and damage to the bark has been created by elephant tusks. The tusks are able to gouge in there and rip the bark off. And we were talking just now about medicine. Trees, most of their medicine is in the bark and in the roots. The leaves have got some 
not all the time, but the bark and the roots have got. So this tree itself, the marula, has got lots of antihistamine properties in the bark. It's got lots of um, healing properties for fever and the like. And so elephants will feed on that. So the tusks are very, very useful for gouging and digging into trees. They also use them quite well in defense if they are threatened. An elephant can not only use its weight, but it can actually use its tusks to, to injure or hurt something that's causing them distress or harm. Okay, let's move up Owen, maybe we'll get another view of these two. So yes, yeah, some elephants are born without tusks. It's not very common in the Kruger. We do get a few females, but um, it's just one of those those things that happen. Some of the females don't get tusks. They don't see too many males without tusks. Not saying that they don't occur, but it's also a genetic sort of trait. So they pass on their genes, pass on the tusk gene. Elephants are probably the most selective feeder we have out here because they obviously they can feed on the grass using their trunk. They can also use their foot to help to kick the grass so as to pull the roots out. They can also reach very high up into trees to feed on the tallest leaves. They can also push the trees over if they're big enough to feed on the top of the tree and they can use their tusks to gouge the bark. They can also push the trees over and dig up the roots and they will feed on a lot of fruit when it's available. The marulas are going to be fruiting soon. They are fruiting but they haven't yet gotten ripe and you'll notice that elephants are very selective in that diet. So as summer is sort of playing on you'll notice the grass is going to get tall and greener. You'll notice the elephant's diet becomes almost exclusively grass. But right now, it's not an enormous amount of grass left or, or currently out. So they will feed on the leaves of the trees. And as they feel those ailments in the body, they'll feed on the medicine as it's needed. Many of the plants we have actually have got enormous amounts of healing properties for the digestive system. And elephants have got an enormous digestive system, huge stomach, huge intestines, and a very large gut. So that's the cecum at the back. It's a big fermentation vessel. And if you know anything about horses, horses have got a similar digestive system to elephants. And digestive issues in horses, things like colic, can be quite fatal. And many of the properties of plants are actually able to alleviate those symptoms quite well. to start off. Bright colors and it attracts the insect to the flower, which is exactly what we're watching right now. This is so exciting. Good. Hi. Hi. The smallest baby blackback jackal I have seen in the wild. Look how full the belly is. <laughs> it is so incredible to spend this time so close to an African penguin. They just make me feel alive. That is incredibly sweet. Grooming each other. Play is vital. This is how they learn. This is how they would tackle prey. There you go, there you go. There you go, there you go. Hi. 
heart is pumping right now. Look at this, everybody. We've got a live kill. There's nowhere to go. Just such an incredible privilege to be out here. It just keeps on delivering. There she goes, going for the youngster. She got it. That's what I'm talking about. Look at that. This is insanely good footage. Sounds like Steve is having quite a lot of fun with those elephants. And just a bit of an update on those hyenas. They did move off, as we've seen. We did manage to have a quick glimpse of them at the den site. There was a brief visual of Corky heading into the entrance of the den site, sniffing and then leaving. And soon after that, we did have a very, very brief visual of the cubs. So they are fine and they are alive, uh, at least some of them. And we had no visual of ribbon. So as part of our sensitivity uh, doctrine, we had to basically leave. Just, you know, we, we, we don't stick around when there is no visual of the mother. And that's purely just for the safety of the cubs as well as part of the habituation process to the vehicles. Uh, but that's good news. We know that at least some of the cubs are alive. So Darren and I are now going to continue on our main plan is to look for lions. And we're roughly in the central eastern part of Juma. And we will take Cheetah Cutline up to the north. We'll check Biffelsuk Dam. We know the Tilamatis are very likely somewhere in the north or east of, uh, of, 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 of the, 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 the property of Juma. And uh, I just want to quickly reverse. There's this view, beautiful herd of Nyala here. That, I'm just going to reverse a little bit. And reposition. You got that down. This is beautiful Nyala, but let's just stop here, that's fine. And now they're into the bush. <laughs> Oh, so they are heading into some thick stuff there. And as part of our policies to reduce impact, we do not follow creatures like Nyala or the general game animals into the bush, and we limit it to the high profile uh, animals. And yeah, I see quite a few comments. Everybody's delighted to hear about Ribbon's cubs. Now, we don't know how many are in there. We just had a brief visual of uh, two of them. And I was just telling Darren as well that, I, that you know, there is a chance that uh, Ribbon might be inside the den. They're often, she might still be in there. But that is just a speculation. That's good. They're alive. There's a little bird. I think I'm gonna give this one to to you as well. It's a very small black finch like bird. And let's see if anybody can identify this bird for us. 
can send your answers through to hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter. If you're watching on YouTube, you can send through to uh, at FC. One of those who are on our website as well can s submit your answer there. Actually, not a finish like that. She got quite a bit of a sharp beak. Ah, oh, Shreya, who reckons it's a magpie shrike, and we only have that head and a bit of the neck to go into ID. So very good call. Can you see that Shrike-like beak with that very sharp little bent tip? And there's confirmation. Shreya, well done. That is a magpie Shrike. That's it indeed. Just thought that would be quite a nice one because it was rather obscured and one only has a a little bit of the bird to go by to try and ID it. Right, so we're gonna continue. And like I mentioned, we own the eastern parts. We're gonna head a little bit further north now and continue our search for any sign of line. And as you know, yesterday I did not find them and I don't like to lose. Hi, Eleanor. Yes, I do have quite a few, but if I have to choose one particular bird, it would be... Oh, let me choose one that's the sound that I... I'm going to answer the, uh, give you two answers then. Just purely on a sound that I like for no particular reason, it's just a, quite a nice sound, is the Birchall's Kukul. You know, that sort of bubbly you know, almost like water running out of a bottle. It's just got such a tropical sound. And something as simple as a Cape Turtle Dove, that sort of, you know, that repeated sort of type of um, noise. And the reason I like that a lot, it just reminds me of my childhood on the farm uh, with my parents. You know, just that's, that's a noise that I can just recall from my childhood. Early morning, my, my grandfather used to bring us tea and it was, um, it's just one of those sort of sort of childhood memories that it brings back. And so those are my two favorites. But there's a lot of them with some really, really pretty calls. And so we are gonna continue. Your sun is quite bright today. Eh? Okay, we are heading into a little dip, so we might have a slight break in image. Hi, my name is Leslie and I live in Ashton in a little town in the Boerland in the Western Cape. Uh, why I started to watch Wild Earth is because I actually grew up in Zimbabwe and born and bred there and I absolutely love that type of country. It just brings me back to my grassroots. 
My favorite thing about the wild earth is, of course, the animals. We don't get the big five down here um, or many of the little five. And I would love to take my little grandson up, who will be nine next year, perhaps with me on this experience. I'm hoping to steer him into a huge love of wildlife and perhaps even some sort of career in it. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm so looking forward to it. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Staying one step ahead is the key to survival out in the African wild. And now you can stay in front of the pack with a Wild Earth weekly newsletter. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you will get exclusive behind the scenes stories about your favorite guides and camera operators. Information about our upcoming plans and projects will be delivered to your inbox every week before anyone else. And you can hone your guiding skills by taking part in our Identify Me Nature Quizzes. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. It just pretended to be dead. Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> I can't. How do I? <laughs> that, that is hands down the coolest. <laughs> Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. My name is Lauren, and I'm currently working in Juma Private Game Reserve here in South Africa. I love answering your questions during the live safaris. It's my favorite part. It feels like you're on the vehicle with me and I'm able to teach you exactly what you want to know. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, you must go to the live safari page and ask your question below the live feed. Welcome back, everybody. Well, you can probably notice that we've left our small group of elephants and um, I had a feeling to check a road and we found some pretty fresh male leopard tracks heading south along that road. Um, I've lost them for now, but I'm just going to check. There's a junction coming up. We know we like junctions to see exactly where he might have gone. He came towards the side and he either went that way or that way. So I'll do a quick little squiz here. And if he hasn't crossed the road that way, then he's possibly gone into this block, you know. Male leopards moving on a road. They might uh, be on a territorial mission, uh, but they also move along the road when they go hunting, because hunting makes life quite easy. Walking on the road, that is. Just like now, driving in normal range on the car. You don't really need to pay too much attention to the road because it's it's clear of obstacles. So we can drive a bit faster, leopards can walk a bit faster, lions too, and then suddenly their attention will, will change as they pick up on the smell or hear something in the thickets and then they'll move off in pursuit. So just checking if he didn't turn down this way. Nothing, nothing fresh. So he yeah, either went into the block there. Lenny, well initially, um, leopard tracks and lion tracks and hyena tracks, if you don't really know, can be quite similar. Um, but the easiest way, and you've got your, your knife there, Owen, a little leather man, I, I flew up, so I don't have my knife with me because I only brought uh, carry-on luggage and they don't like um, you to carry weapons on the plane, although my knife is more of a measuring tool than anything else. So I'm going to find the track here for you, male leopard track, and I'm going to show you, use something like this. This is 10 centimeters and use this. Whenever you look at a track, before you go la la la, just go, here is a um, measurement. It's gonna be nice on that side or probably on this side, hey Owen? Let me just find it for you. Okay. 
very clear. Just gone through that little block there. Okay, so I'm going to try and line own up in a way that gives you a good perspective of this track. <laughs> Not very clear for you, Owen. I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. That's an okay one. Over here. Excuse me while I just jump off and unplug myself. Now here is a track. Can you see it, Owen? Okay, so here is the track over here. And I put this knife down. Here's the back of the track. And here's the front of the track. So this knife is 10 centimeters and this front of the toe is almost 11. This is a big male leopard. Another thing to look at is how wide it is. So if I did that, it's equivalently the same sort of width. Three lobes at the back here and very wide. So that's a male leopard. Now a lioness would be about over there, 13, 12 to 13, and a male line would be over there, close to 15 centimeters, maybe a little bit closer to there. So the size difference is very important to pay attention to. Now hyena track is, there's one right over here. There's one right over there. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it's got a kidney shaped back pad. The toes are pinched together and uh, some people will confuse hyena with leopard, but that back pad actually moves at a very sharp angle. Whereas if I've moved back to the leopard track, the leopard track is parallel at the front and the back. So a female leopard, eight centimeters, a male leopard, 10, and in soft sand, a little bit bigger, a lioness, 12 to 13, a male lion, 14 to 16. So measure, and if you're not sure, just measure. That's always very helpful. Okay, I hope that has given you some perspective. Thank you for your your weapon there, Owen. Now his last track is here. It goes towards this big um, tortured tree and then he's gone. So he probably went straight through like that. So I'm going to go check another road around the corner here called Mendoza see if maybe he's turned. He hasn't gone left, he hasn't gone right. We figure out the area the animal's gotten into by checking if he's come out or not and then we can ascertain that he's possibly inside that block and then we can work further. So, but I'm, it's it's difficult to say. That's a big male leopard. I'm almost certain it's Mawati from yesterday. I had a look at the footage again last night and I'm 100% convinced that it was Mawati yesterday that jumped on his poor son. Okay, well when you come back I will show you in my book the difference between the leopard, lion, hyena track as well, just so that you get a good perspective. And uh, sounds like the bushwalk team is out and about. So let's go say good morning. Now I know it's not a woodland kingfisher, but it's still a pretty fantastic bird. I mean, you know, we've got to lead up to it. We can't go straight into the woodland kingfisher. We've got to give Steve a bit of a challenge. Let him, let him you know, have a good chance of trying to find it. A spoonbill is just resting at the banks of Leopard Dam. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Anderson. Behind the camera is Craig. And this is Eco Training's Pride Lands Conservancy, where we've decided to maximize our chances for that woodland kingfisher by walking along the drainage line of Leopard Dam. Apparently, one has been heard in this area and knowing woodland kingfishers they like the drainage lines close to these dams big trees lots of insect activity the spoonbill was in the water a little earlier 
It's just stepped out for a moment. I think it saw us walking up and it's just trying to figure out whether we're a threat before potentially going back to sifting through the water for any invertebrates, maybe the odd, the odd frog. I don't know actually if they eat frogs, but definitely invertebrates, little larvae, things like that. See, it's starting to move now behind some, some branches. Oh, it's looking down at the ground like it wants to snap something up. Be unusual if we see one eating something out of the water. What are you up to? Where are you going? Let's try and see if we can walk a little bit towards the open patch here. I don't want to scare it off. I do want to have a good view of it. I'm going to start seeing more and more of them as, uh, as the rain starts falling. They tend to move in relation to where the rain falls because they know that's where there'll be water. And we see them flying over quite frequently, but it's only now recently that they've started to actually land again at the dams around Pride Lands. actually had three of them fly over in Lovu Dam at the camp a couple of days ago. Gotta walk really slowly. Gotta walk as quietly as possible. There is our usual spot that we said, oh, the elephants have been here. They've been doing some, some rearranging, it looks like. In the spot. See how a lot of birds and animals will go and just stand behind stuff to feel a bit more safe. So this one's probably going to go and walk behind the other side of the small Tambuti Island there. Beautiful bird. Oh, it's got a bit of a fright from the, from the blacksmith lapwing. Blacksmith lapwings are quite vocal and aggressive to any birds that might come close to their nests. Not that the spoon bull would be much of a threat, but... by Mr. Spimble. Ooh. So Steve, Steve's, what, Steve's saying that he thinks they'll be around the 18th of November, which is incidentally the, the date that I thought that the Impala lambs would arrive this year. And I was so very wrong. They've been abundant already. But I believe that the woodland kingfisher is here already. I mean, we've heard one. It's been confirmed by two different guides on the property now, or three actually. So we know it's around, but when it will make its first appearance on camera? Hmm, the 18th of November. Pretty good guess, but I think, I think in the next couple of days. I think by the 13th of November. No, let's, let's, let's be, by the 15th of November, we would have seen it on camera. There's our grebe as well. The grebe is still here. In the middle of the, of the dam. This was the young grebe. I saw it first time a few months ago and it was still with its juvenile colors, but now it's full adult plumage and will probably be very territorial already. If I play the call on my phone, I'm sure it will come blistering over to investigate. Let me test it out. Let me test out if it does respond to a call. I know that they normally are very uh, responsive with this kind of stuff you don't shouldn't overdo it third once or twice more than that and it's going to be disrupted oh, he's listening okay that's enough still quite young looking over here definitely interested in the call that i just made not yet ready to challenge. It's quite interesting, the bird calls that you play on the different apps that we use. We never know, is it an adult bird? Is it a male? Is it a female? Is it a, you know, whatever. So sometimes the, the call itself can be quite, I don't know, worrisome for the birds. They might be like, oh, I need to be quiet. I look too faced. He looked over, but then he, then he relaxed again. A beautiful bird and a beautiful day. Fingers crossed, everyone, for more cool stuff happening around Leopard Dam.
Wild Earth turned 14 this year, and as many of you know, we have created a beautiful coffee table book to celebrate our history so far. The book is made up of memorable animal sightings from the last 14 years as chosen by Wild Earth viewers from all over the world. And now, we're finally ready to go to print. But before we do, we're opening sales again for a very short time for those people who still want to buy this little piece of Wild Earth history. Head over to our website to buy your copy. Once again, thank you to all those who have contributed to make this, we think quite possibly, the best coffee table book ever made. Our lives are dictated by alarm clocks, traffic jams, constant multitasking and countless distractions. The wilderness is where many of us feel the most human. On a bushwalk, we become part of the natural landscape. As you step off the vehicle, everything comes alive. As with any risky experience, Walking amongst these animals inspires awe and appreciation. Now it's your turn to go on a bushwalk. Join us from Pride Lands as we slow down our thoughts, put aside our distractions, and reconnect with a place that first taught us how to be human. Hello, boy. You are a monster. And he's coming right up to us. Hello, boy. Oh, settle down. Settle down. He is very, very close. He's pushing his trunk against the car. You can feel the car moving. Hey, 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 hey. Stop that. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. Right, so we are now at Buffelzoog Dam. There's no sign of any line activity here. It's always nice just to stop at these water holes and just literally take a of binoculars and just scan around. You might find things that you're not looking at or necessarily looking for. And while you enjoy this lovely scene, I'm just going to keep quiet for a minute or so just to scan around with my binoculars. Other than a few birds, there's not much around here, but it is a very, very tranquil scene. Sometimes that in itself is Yeah, and I totally agree with you, Barbara. It is a beautiful scene. Sometimes it's, you know, and you won't easily get caught in this mad rush to find the big animals and the guys with the big teeth. And sometimes just take a pause and just, you know, just enjoy the scenery. Let's just see what. 
Look at that. A dragonfly sitting on that little twig. It is a bit far for me to identify this species. This is a very, very long shot. And I've often found that when you do sit around at water holes, especially if you can go and sit in shade somewhere, and it's almost as if the bush starts to unfold again, and it's as if your presence becomes accepted and everything just turns back to normal after your initial disturbance when you arrive at the water hole. Oh, it's a uh, I just saw those two bands on its on its wings. Yes, indeed, Lola, it is. Very, very pretty indeed. And I think it is a banded groundling, if I'm not mistaken. That's, I just saw, had a brief visual on those on the wings and the banded groundling does have those very distinct black bands on each of the four wings. And if we can just turn again, I'm nearly certain it's a banded groundling, which is a very common dragonfly. Oh yeah, there we go. That was... And... Thanks, uh, James Richardson also confirms that it is in fact a bandit grounding or southern bandit groundling. You know, I often think of predators as, you know, the big, you know, lion and leopard and hyenas and so forth, but dragonflies are, they're the, they're the lions of, of the insect world. These guys are voracious predators of other insects who mostly catches the other insects that well, they prey in flight. And those legs of theirs are basically bent inwards, almost like a little basket. And they can grab smaller insects in flight and then even consume them in flight. Which is quite, quite amazing. Hi, Daniel. They would lay their eggs in water, so they don't actually create a nest. And the lorry will then hatch there. Quite interesting. that mating also happens in flight.
I can just tell you, just sitting here now, watching this dragonfly and listening to other sounds, and you can just feel how the sun is getting more intense. You almost get that same feeling with the dragonfly sitting on that, you know, with a light reflecting from the water. You can, you can just feel how the sun is getting more and more intense. So it's probably a good idea to head on and try and see if we can't at least find any sign of, of, of those lines that we intended to before it gets too warm. I actually have to give credit to, <laughs> to Darren for finding that dragonfly. So well done, Darren. <laughs> Now, I believe there's a bit of a, a bet going on here about when the woodland kingfishers are going to be arriving here, and uh, I didn't get Mike's answer there yet, uh, but I believe Steve believe it's the 18th of November. I'm going to go for the 15th of November. And my reasoning is that rains The rain has started slightly early, even though we're not fully into our rainy season, but I know elsewhere further north in the province and so forth, it has rained a lot. So I reckon also the 15th, and apparently Mike also reckons it is the 15th. So that would be my guess as well. It is usually mid to late November, sometimes earlier. All depends on rain patterns. That's what's going to determine when they arrive. Earlier, there was a question about the bird calls that I like and which is my favorite. And yes, I did mention uh, those other two birds. But the Woodland Kingfisher is definitely amongst my top five favorites. Such, such a beautiful sound. Well. We're going to head off again to see if there's no sign of line or any sign. And we're going to link to Mike and let's see what he's up to on his bushwalk. So again, not a woodland kingfisher, but something very cool spotted by our security, Dani, as we were walking past. I said, we need a new arthropod. We can't do millipedes anymore. And he said, what about this one? And then we looked and we found two wasps in the middle of copulating. So you can see the female is underneath and the male is on top. And the male is using his mandibles to grip the neck of the female so she cannot fly away or move whilst he's in the very delicate process of mating. You can actually see he's got his abdomen bent around and he's busy, you know, passing his reproductive, um, I don't know, like fluids onto her. She's accepting them through her abdomen. It's very interesting. I mean, this is a very, very delicate process. And he is like having to manipulate his, his abdomen in such a way it looks very uncomfortable. And it's a long process as well. I'm quite interested to see how long it's taking because of course they cannot move when they're in this position. He's busy holding her wings and he's busy gripping her. And you know, we're so close to them and, and they're not even moving. They're just trying to stay more or less hidden from us, or not to grab our attention. But it's so interesting to watch this happen. These are wasps. I don't think that they are wasps that could sting us. They don't seem like the stinging type of wasp. Which is super interesting. Have you ever seen two wasp-like animals mating before? Actually, it's very difficult to discern which is his body and which is hers, the way they're sort of twisted together like that. Quite pretty, quite beautiful actually. I don't know if you've got light on that side there, Craig, but on this side, geez, they look iridescent. Really, really pretty. Oh my gosh. Oh, I've just caught myself caught in a very big thorn. Round, round, round. Really, really pretty little wasps. And she's also gripping onto the stick with her with her mandibles in order to remain as motionless as possible for him to finish the process. Now, it also, Craig mentioned something interesting. 
he might actually be holding on to her like this so that she doesn't eat him. You know, it's very common with the spiders. I'm not so sure about wasps, but with spiders, very often, and with mantises, very often the male gets consumed by the female before the mating process is even over. And then the male in some mantis species continues to pass reproductive material even once the head has been completely chewed off and eaten. And it's just the body of the male there, but the, the, the abdomen still continues to pump the fluid through to the female. And this ensures that he mates with no others, only her. Which is quite an interesting way to go, I suppose. I suppose it could be worse, worse ways to go. King Quad, it is an incredible sight, and it's yeah one I've never seen before, not this close anyway. We've been seeing dragonflies mating quite a lot recently. In fact, we saw them last night. Uh, just like pods or pairs of dragonflies connected together flying over the water and then just the female dipping down into the into the water every now and again after the mating just dipping down dropping eggs close to vegetation at the banks of of the dams that's very interesting he's actually let go of her wings now so i wonder if it's almost complete the process it's actually very difficult to tell male from female on this i mean the male is the one on top the one that's actually um, clasping the female, but normally you'd see a difference in their antenna. Um, these two, I cannot see too much of a difference. In fact, the female's antenna seems a bit longer. Normally the male has a feathery antenna in order to pick up the pheromones of the female, and the female doesn't need that. Her antenna is just for feeling around for food. I'm wounded. I think, I think we're going to have to call off the, the bushwalk. I stepped on a thorn. And now I'm bleeding. Please, everyone, help me. Send, send, send a prayer. I might not make it through this walk. It's been nice. It's been, it's been a nice morning. I've, I've enjoyed everything that I've had a chance to show you all. But I think this is the end for me. After all these years of watching Wild Earth just on your computer, you can now watch it through your connected TV, your Apple TV, or your Roku box. And if you're like me, you're always on the move, then go download the mobile app on your App Store and watch it from your phone. Helping kids to fall in love with nature is critical. Our future depends on it. Wild Earth has had the opportunity to take many children from all over the world on safari. Some from right here on our doorstep. Welcome to those of you watching from Hananani Primary School, just outside Dixie Village. They love um, like learning about nature because you know now we, we're having like a crisis um, of like rhino poaching. We all need each other, so it is very very important for the kids to learn about animals, on how to save them or even to protect them. My favorite animal is an elephant because they are very cute, although they're eating the trees or the plants, but they are still very cute to me. The way they explained. Um, the animals asking questions and we saw, saw our names on the screen. It was so exciting. Guys, just watch what's happening. See, watch the elephant, watch the lions. See, the first ones to run are the cubs. I'm not sure how scared you were, but I was quite nervous. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. What fascinates me most about the animal circle of life is the intricacies between the large and the very, very small. I mean, it's very easy to go out there and find the large. Once you find the large, the cascading effect down to the small absolutely fascinates me. Alertness and situation awareness is by far the number one aspect for protecting ourselves out on safari. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth.
Welcome back live everybody. Well, we were circling that block earlier. No tracks came out of that block, but I'm almost certain by the size of those tracks that it was Mulwati. So there's no point in me trying any harder in the morning to try to find him because he's a very unplayable fellow in the daytime. So this afternoon I'll go work that block again. It seems like he didn't come out. he might still be on the property but then I'm not an expert tracker so I might have missed something as well but there wasn't any obvious tracks coming out so we move back into the area of the leopard interaction from yesterday if you recall we had what we thought to be a male leopard running with a bit of meat like a young impala but it could have been a young something we never found the meat but we did find the leopard so just a nice little slow meander along this road to see if he maybe came out the leopard luck was strong with us yesterday dense the bush will become as summer progresses well it will become very dense it depends on the amount of rain we have the bush itself the trees will still thicken up a bit compared to what they are now but it's grass that grows nice and tall so this entire area here will be overgrown the grass will just stand really tall last year it was impenetrable you couldn't see five ten meters off the road which makes life quite tricky. So these are our last few days, few weeks, I suppose, of, of being able to spot game from the road. But what it does do as well, with the bush densening up, we get a lot of dew, a lot of condensation on the grass. So many of our animals uh, tend to walk on the roads because it's less cumbersome and they don't get as wet. So we can be quite lucky, but if they just step off the road, they're gone. Even herds of elephant disappear into the thickets when the summer is here. So it does make game viewing in the summer months quite tricky. And that's why winter months are definitely uh, regarded as some of the best months for game viewing because it's dry, vegetation's very open, and tracking is a lot easier. Also water's very less available, so more localized water makes it easier to sort of figure out where the animals might be. Right now, after just a little bit of water, all these little depressions in the landscape have got some liquid. So we've got to check 200 more places in an area rather than just one or two when it comes to water. And there might also be some small little pans we don't even know about. I've been here for quite some time, so I know about a lot of them. But uh, sometimes I've done a bushwalk and I'm like, wow, I didn't even know this was here. And uh, the reality of that is, for example, this male leopard that made a kill somewhere here, he could hoist that meat. And because there's all these little pans here, there's no need for him to walk anywhere to go and drink. Anywhere on the road, that is. So then to track him down becomes very difficult. Yesterday, Darren spotted Shasha just here. We were just talking about, uh, someone was saying the leopard magic has been strong with us today and I was commenting on it and as did that, Darren was like, oh, there's a leopard. And we left him lying just in the thickets on the right hand side. Now, what are the chances that he's lying right there? Owen, what do you reckon? It's just a few meters off the road, yeah? So let's just have a look don't think he's still there he's got better things to do than lie around all day long but uh, if it is him who made the kill then I'm gonna need to check this area quite nicely so we left him lying here on this little bit of grass and lo and behold he is not there anymore that's okay 
Watch your head there, O Dog. This drainage system is a very interesting one. It's a very good one. I'm not getting those comms. They seem to be breaking up. A lot of beeping happening. Mel, sorry. You are asking me a question. I'm not copying. Victor, that's a very good question about how leopards choose their den sites. Well, I can speak from experience, just from what I've seen. Um, for example, Karula used to be the, the dominant female in this area years ago. She's Tundi's mother. And where Karula found a den site, generally in these drainage line depressions, kind of like that one over there, uh, where Karula found a nice den, a hole, a place maybe where a tree's fallen over so there's a little bit of cover and there's access into the bank because of the roots that have damaged the bank as they fell. So these little caves underneath some dense vegetation. And what, we, what we've seen or what I was told is that where Tandi was born, um, Karula being the mother, Tandi went back and used similar den sites to what her mother used. And what we've noticed, the den that Tlalam was found in a little while ago, and when I found her at a den a while back, Tristan told me that that's where Tlalamba spent a little bit of time as a cub. So it's familiarity. Um, obviously, there needs to be access to water. It mustn't be too close. These females can walk, but cover is essential. And these drainage lines, these sort of depressions, these dry riverbeds with banks and fallen trees are the ideal little hideaway for lion and leopard alike. They both like to do the same sort of thing. Uh, hyena and wild dog, they use termite mounds that they've accessed into. And so we see in Klalamba now, she's using exactly the same area that Tundi was. Remember that um, when Maribs was born in the same area, pretty much the same area that uh, Klalamba was. So bearing in mind that female leopards carve out a piece of their mother's territory. So it's an area that they're familiar with. It's an area they spend a lot of time on their own while mum was away. And uh, there's sort of a, a safety, a, a, a familiarity to it, something that they feel quite comfortable with. And then when they come looking for den sites, they generally go into the area that they know quite well and they scratch it out. In saying that though, Shadulu comes from the south and she had her cubs here in the north. So she actually moved away from her birthplace. So I spent a drive once following Shadulu just before she had her cubs. And she checked every single possible nook and cranny from one side of Juma to the other. Didn't check the Milwati because this was not really her side of the area. She checked more of our western side. And she didn't find anything suitable because she didn't den here. And she denned over on Simbambili's side where she found the ideal conditions. Yeah. Bearing in mind there's going to be more than one den because they use it for a few weeks and then they move. The smell of mum coming and going starts to get a little bit strong and that has a very strong potential of attracting unwanted attention. Very good. Well, we're going to carry on down the road here, do a little loop around the block, see if anything has come out while we send you over to Chris. He's got some in parlor. It seems like both myself and Steve are really having our work cut out today to find our cats and the tracks of cats and I'm leaving no stone unturned. I'm stopping at every single herd of Impala investigating their behavior and although this is not a herd this is just one lone female with her newborn lamb
they move away from the herds when they do give birth to hide the lamb for a few days to just strengthen up a bit and then they systematically join back uh, back up in, 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 in herds. And we're only starting to see that now where you know more and more of these females join join the herds. And these impala lambs are like magnets for for predators, especially leopard, jackal, caracal, hyena, even some birds of prey like martial eagles have been known to to target them. Now I'm just enjoying watching babies. They're always, always cute and they always quite a hit. It's just moved into that, uh, that little tree line there. <laughs> Just like Steve's holding his fingers crossed for his leopard tracks or even leopard, we are doing the same with the lions. And and we um, we'll keep going. Good morning, Joe. Wants to know how all that thing that lamb is, and that is a couple of days at best. Sort of, I would go for. Usually within about three, three or four days after birth, they'll start joining the herd. So it's very likely younger than about four or so days. I would say about two, three days. Could even be a day or two. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's less than a week even. Um, they grow quite fast though. We'll try and see if we do get another herd more in the open uh, with a couple of more lambs and we'll definitely try and come back to that. But you can clearly see how much more nervous this female would be. They, um, once they move back into, into herd scenario, they, you can see they do calm down a bit more, more vulnerable. And, well, nice comment there, happy Ahina, saying that these lambs are so adorable and absolutely, now there's, there's, you know, anything baby and small is usually adorable and sweet and so forth, but Impala are definitely uh, amongst the ones that I think is the cutest animals around. So let's continue our plan to look. So we're on the northern gut line here, so we are driving slowly and I'm keeping an eye on the road for any potential lion tracks. I've always dreamed of Africa since I was a little girl. And then I just decided, you know what? It's time to come. It's time to just live the dream. If you want to go on safari with a Wild Earth Guide whilst honing your bush knowledge and of course featuring in one of our shows, then head over to our website. It is so exciting. You're able to see the difference of what you see on TV to how much work it actually is creating what you see on TV. The leopards, Mareeps. How could you not really fall in love with that cat? He's got such a personality and you never know what he's going to do. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could be making your first ever on-screen appearance. It's about just being together and seeing and enjoying the animals and the great outdoors. It's just been a great experience. Certainly, if anyone's able to, dare to dream and come. Do you dream of traveling to a far-flung wilderness location where life continues as normal? A place where you can escape to nature and breathe. If you become a Wild Earth Explorer, then this could soon become a reality. Subscribe today and stand a chance to win regular travel prizes. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. We have a baby pangolin, a baby. 
baby pangolin. This is off the charts. I'm, uh, yes, I'm, this animal is about from your fingertips to your elbow. That's the total length of this animal. This is unreal. This is unreal. This is unreal. This is like now my fourth Christmas in a week. <laughs> we should do this more often. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. Hi, my name is Tristan Dix and I am a guide here at Juma Private Game Reserve for Wild Earth. We love connecting you to the African bush and we always look forward to all of your questions. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, you'll need to register on the website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit a question below the live feed. Catch up with me on Wild Earth. No luck yet, no luck, but I will not be beaten. Even if it's not this morning, at some stage I will get by lions. We're just gonna go through a little dip, yeah? So you might have a slight break in transmission there. Go quickly. All right, that should do it. Yeah, so nothing uh, unusual about that Impala female and youngster that we looked at now. They are normally quite uh, nervous when they are by themselves like that. So the fact that it's nervous doesn't really necessarily tell me that there's a predator around. So stick to the plan, look for tracks. Daniel, and so when the impalas are born, for the first couple of days, the mother will be separate from the herd and she will hide it in a specific area. And once it's strong enough, remember it gets that sort of colostrum milk initially and it gets stronger, stronger, stronger. And usually a few days after that, three, four days, the mother will join up with the herd but by then it's already strong enough to keep up with the herd no matter what so impala lambs are very precocial in that fashion meaning they are very strong at you know as you know, in fact within an hour after birth it can already run with the mother but for that first couple of days it just needs to strengthen up a bit before it can join the herd but after that it it will maneuver with the herd pretty much like any of the adults. It's not a matter of keeping up, which is the concern really if you're a baby impala. It's just as your senses and reflexes might not still be, you know, as developed as the adults and your knowledge and you know, of the area will also not nearly be up on the same level so therefore you could be targeted by the predators and because there's such a lot of them at the same time no tracks yet Lee, I totally agree with you and I really hope that we will find them. Now look, if we don't find them this morning, you know what, they're not going to go anywhere. We will find them at some stage and we just saw a couple of either eagles or large bird of prey up here. Let's see if we can get a little closer and see what they are. Oh goodness, look at this. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just look at that. <laughs> okay, it's not a lion, but something unique nonetheless. Something not often seen.
depending on where you are. Just look quickly. The Southern Ground Hornball. He's going to come out now. It's things like this that, that I absolutely love to do. You're busy talking about something and, you know, you're looking for lines and suddenly you just run into something random. He's a bit shy, this one, today. Hiding behind the bushes. Nice. Good morning, Simon. Yes, indeed. I am an avid birder. And not only is it quite an important aspect of being a nature guide, is to make sure that you know as many birds as possible. Uh, however, I must admit that even though I am fairly accomplished as a birder, it is not my main strength as a guide. Um, there's a number of guides that I've worked with that are more advanced than I would be. So, as guides, we always try and play it to our strengths. But, you know, it's, yes, most of the birds I will be able to identify. And it, I can see enough of the bird, of its features, in order to identify that. But yes, I do love birding. I do love to visit new areas within our country and even you know elsewhere abroad and try and add some, some birds to my list. So everywhere where I travel, my binoculars are coming with me, even if I'm on holiday. It's now really getting fairly warm, so you can see the vultures and quite a lot of birds of prey now making use of the rising thermal air to start to forage. And in the meantime, let's head over to Steve on his bumble. Nice and Chris. Well, welcome back to us, everybody. We are just bumbling now. We don't really have any tracks to follow, so we're going to go towards Treehouse Dam. And I think it's about time to go and enjoy a quiet moment with some coffee. Yeah, everybody, boil your kettle. Get your tea bag soaking. Get your plunger coffee on the go or warm up your cup if you're using a machine coffee. In the next few moments we'll be stopping to enjoy a quiet moment. A beautiful washing hole where we had a wonderful sunset last night. It really was a very pretty sunset. First a nice sunset in the wild. Just slowly bumbling through, looking for any wild flowers. There's um, a number of leaves are emerging out, but oh well, it sounds like Mike might have found something. Let's go see if indeed it's what he thinks. There you have it folks, 
the first woodland kingfisher of the season on camera here at Pridelands. Steve threw down the challenge. We accepted and challenge complete. Calling its absolute heart out, trying its best to find any potential mates or its partner. Beautiful turquoise blue back. Standing at the top of what looks like a dead, looks like a leadwood potentially. Maybe an old knob thorn, I don't know, but the Woodlands Kingfishers are back. The first ones were seen in the North Kruger almost two weeks ago. It's taken them about two weeks to travel the 300 kilometers or so from the North Kruger to here. How cool is that, everyone? We're going to try and get a bit closer just now. We don't want to do it while we walk. Well, we can actually walk a little bit and try and get a bit closer to get a, a good view. But when the challenge was thrown down, we knew we would find one. Actually, I said the 15th of November, but I kind of, I should have stuck to my guns because I had talked about it earlier and I'd said, we'll find one. The first animal we'll see today will be a woodland kingfisher. Let's try and see if we can get a bit closer to it. I don't know how it will work out. So we saw one fly over us earlier, and I think it's the one this one is looking for. to fly off. I, I played the call earlier to try and see if it would come closer to us, but I think it was too quiet, my, my phone, so I could not get the call to travel far enough. That's such a good view as well, just sitting up on the top of that tree there. I mean, it's really putting a lot of effort into calling because of course it wants to attract a mate, but it's also risking it all. It's just arrived, it hasn't had a lot of time to gather its energy, gather its strength. Oh, let's go this way, it looks it's going to be a bit of an open view. So to call like this from the top of a tree, it really puts itself at risk. But the greatest risks often provide the greatest rewards. So it might be the first woodlands who gets to, oh no, it's flying off, darn it. I knew it would do that, darn it. That's fine. We had a view, and it was awesome. It's now calling from somewhere over there. We're not gonna keep following it because it'll keep flying, I think, as we get closer. But yes, what a cool thing. I hope you enjoyed that. That was really awesome for us because we've been hearing them since like two days ago, maybe. And so we knew they were around, but so nice to be able to catch it on camera. Especially with all the greenery starting to come out, all the insects that we've been seeing, it's the perfect time for them. Plenty of food. Oh look, in fact there's the food that it might eat right there. One plum colored dung beetle. Just over there. Watch out dung beetle. The woodlands are back. Be careful. Recently, Wild Earth viewers around the world experienced the birth of a brand new hippo. <gasps> oh, look at the way it's walking. Oh, oh, the case is so precious. This tiny calf has started its life in a large lake next to an award-winning game lodge called Chitwa Chitwa. If you sign up to be a Wild Earth explorer before the 1st of December 2021, you and a friend stand a chance to win a three-night stay at this award-winning luxury lodge. Along with unwinding on the deck and relaxing in the pool, you may even catch a glimpse of this brand new hippo whilst on one of their unforgettable safaris. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Wild Earth knows it is critical to help as many young people as possible to connect with the natural world. We hope that by bringing the wilderness to our future conservationists, we will inspire a love for nature and perhaps plant a seed which will flourish in the future. Over the years, kids from countries all over the world have joined us on safari. I really enjoy learning about the leopards and the cubs and how they hunt and live. We got to see different types of antelopes and we also saw our male lions tracks. 
I got to learn about uh, like different types of animals in their natural habitats. It was like we were on a real safari, so it was kind of cool. We got to see a lot of unique animals. That whole safari live video just inspired me to fulfill my dream of becoming a safari guide as well. Guys, have a look at what we've got. This is better than my birthday. Look at that. This is the first time that I ever see cubs this small. Th this is so special. This has officially just become my best sighting of all times. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. Hello everybody and welcome back live to Juma. Welcome back to Treehouse Dam where we promised to go and spend a moment in contemplation with a cup of coffee and it is a beautiful morning to do so. Although the sun is starting to get rather warm, the birds are in full chorus. So it's always a nice moment to just sit back, pour yourself that cup of tea or coffee or whatever it is you feel like a little bit stronger if it's that time of day and we're just going to allow you to just soak in the noises around us. So nice to hear all of these birds crawling. Long billed crumbeck, Dedrick's cuckoo, Cape turtle dove, grey bushrike, black crowned chagra, to name a few. Joshua wants to know if I prefer bushwalking to game driving. Joshua, they both have such different elements to them. The thing with being on a vehicle is you can't get much closer to big animals. You can follow a leopard for the entire afternoon. You can actually follow up on alarm calls and potentially see the animal for more than a few seconds. There is a comfort zone to being in a vehicle. Obviously, you don't use as much energy. Uh, animals seem to understand or respect a vehicle. And there's less risk. Being out on foot is life-changing. Um, being out on foot allows you to see the small things, to really ab absorb it all. I mean, even for, for Owen sitting on the back there, all the cam ops, they get quite comfortable sitting on the back of the car. And then suddenly when we're walking, you have to put your left foot in front of your right foot. You have to watch out for the thorns, the potential snakes. And suddenly you're in control 
of what could potentially happen, although you're not in control. I am. So for me, I've taken many people on Game Drive and they've had an amazing experience, but I've taken many people on Bushwalk and I've most certainly changed their lives by doing so. Especially when, I mean, spending time with elephants in a vehicle is magical, it really is, but spending time with elephants on foot, there's no words to describe. So for most people who come to Africa and go on their first safari, I would suggest using a vehicle, going with a trained guide who you have confidence in and allowing them to show you the ins and outs of these big game animals. Get your photos and see the big five and all the big and hairies. And get your photographs and then once you feel comfortable in the bush, then give me a call and we'll go on a bushwalk. There are some beautiful places to explore and uh, the last few months, June through to September, I took many people on trail in the northern Kruger and uh, some of them are looking to book again for next year. It is a life-changing experience. And even if you don't see big game on foot, the knowledge that they're around, the tracks, the signs, the smells, the noises sometimes change your life. I took a group of women on a three-night woman's trail, four-day, and um, it's still washing over me exactly what happened and how everything transpired, but on the second night, Everybody has to do an hour around the fire to keep everybody safe. You just sit there and shine the torch from time to time while everybody sleeps. And there'd been leopards calling for quite some time. I heard them from the distance. And then I went to sleep. And then I don't know what time of night it was, but I got jolted awake by a leopard calling no more than 30 meters from where we were sleeping. And I looked up to see Mimi, who was the girl on duty, the lady on duty, and she was busy in transitioning to Anita, who was also, I don't know who was supposed to be on, but they were kind of in that transition stage of whose turn it is to go next. And the leopard, they could see with a spotlight, was just above us on the rocks, 30, 40 meters away. And the excitement mixed with a little bit of fear, but overwhelming joy that I saw on the faces of those two ladies, having had these leopards calling. There's one on the other side of the river and one right above us. And that whole experience played out over a few hours, but the actual ending that I got woken to that leopard being really close, I sat up, I saw that they were okay. They were very excited, although there was that touch of fear, that fear that brings you into the moment. I can promise you right now, there was nothing else on those two girls' minds than the immediate moment and the presence they found themselves in. And uh, we talk, I still talk to them about it, and it, it's hard to put words to what they experienced that night. I saw them looking okay, and I just rolled back over to sleep and kept a bit of an eye on them, but in the morning, well, they couldn't sleep actually after that, but in the morning they couldn't stop talking about it. It was quite beautiful, quite beautiful. And all that happened was leopards called and, came closer and these two leopards obviously had a territorial moment and we found our camp right between the two. Very, very special. And that, just that moment, changed your life, altered the course of your life forever. The same evening before, as I went to bed, I was just meditating and I heard some elephants and one of the, one of the ladies seemed a little bit concerned and so I went to her and we looked and we shone our light just gently and saw the elephants were walking towards the river. They went into the river. They were splashing and moving. And their whole body language is one of calmness. Because we'd been there for hours. So our smell and our presence was, was, was obvious. And so I just explained that to her, that this is what's happening. Look at their behavior. And then I left her with that. And I went back to bed. And then she had to sit watching the elephants. Obviously, we don't shine on them, but listening to them splashing through the river as they moved away. And a moment like that, sitting on your own, knowing that you're safe, the guy who's looking after you has said it's okay, and so you just sit there and listen. In the morning, 
talking about those moments and how impacting it is on that person's life is so powerful. It affects everybody differently, but there's no, there's no comfort zone because we're not in a vehicle or in a house. We're just out in the elements and all these big animals are all potentially dangerous and if you give them space and you play by the rules, you're generally always going to be okay. So, if it's your first time coming to Africa, go on a guided safari experience with a vehicle. Then after you've done one or two of those, then look at doing a bushwalk trail from a camp. If you're feeling very brave, then give me a call. We'll take you on a primitive wilderness trail where we carry our things and we walk through the wilderness. We'll dig holes for the toilet, filter our water, and survive off of what we have. That will change everybody's life. I've been on many of them before, and each time new things are unlocked inside of me. Prime wilderness. A place where we find ourselves, a place where we originated from, a place that we all are equal. And as I said, you don't actually even need to see the game in those moments to, to feel that. Just the knowledge that there's potential danger around, like this fellow, is enough to drop you right into the moment. We were talking earlier about doing things slowly, doing things with intention and awareness by being out in the wild you are forced into those spaces there's no option you don't think about anything else when you are here when there's potential danger you go right into your body where your intuition speaks to you so Marge you say I've had some incredible experiences I have Marge I've been very lucky I've been very blessed to have had the path I've been on so it's been laid before me and um, beautiful to be able to share these moments with people to um, just now on the Wild Earth Expedition just to sit back and we had elephants joining us at a sundown and I just stood behind everybody just watched their reaction I've had that many times elephants come down and drink when I'm sitting and you know it never gets old but for me sitting and watching how that situation is affecting the people that's where the magic is to the magic is. And I've spent a lot of time in the wild on my own as well and that's really beautiful but the amount of times I've caught myself out on my own looking back to go, hey, did you see that? And then you're like, oh, I'm on my own. So I love sharing it with people. I love sharing these experiences with people and uh, I've yet to have someone say, oh, that didn't, didn't touch me at all. <laughs> Because the wilderness is a wild place, a wild place that connects us to our truth and to our heart and to our ancestors. If I could take you on safari all day and all night, I would. But unfortunately, it's not always the best time to see the animals. Now, in between safaris, you can watch the Wild Earth channel with loads of extra shows. If you have a connected television, Apple TV or Roku box, then download the Wild Earth app and if not, then just find it on the App Store on your phone. We all have a busy schedule and a lifestyle which is confined to stress and tensions. For so many of us, the hustle and bustle of a tedious life has meant we have lost our inner peace. Traveling is an ultimate remedy that let us unwind and helps us experience peace in the lap of nature. Wild Earth encourages the benefits of travel by giving away an amazing prize every month. I was totally overwhelmed to receive this fantastic prize of three nights at Chitwa Chitwa. Wild Earth has been a lifesaver for us during the pandemic and has kept us sane. Thank you so very much, Wild Earth. Sign up to be an explorer today and it could be you jetting off on an all expenses paid for safari experience.
Wild Earth Explorers. It's in your nature. Look at this, the little one is up and about. Certainly hasn't had enough milk at this age. No amount of milk is enough. Oh, cookie. <laughs> Too sweet. Oh, look at this. <laughs> that is stunning. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. My favorite animal is a leopard, purely because I just think they are just the epitome of feline grace and power and the way they can move about in any environment and remain hidden until they want to be seen, I just find it incredibly intoxicating and they're amazingly beautiful. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. Right, so uh, we um, to now quickly take a look at a very big dam up ahead. Just a quick signal dip, and um, the dam is right up ahead here. And we're just going to stop there and literally just uh, try and see what is around at the moment. I love water rolls. There's always something moving there. And we'll be there just now. So I'm going to get onto the dam wall, just sit, listen to some sounds, and see whatever is there. Some impala on the other side of the water hole. Might be a few birds, there could be some reptiles, there could be anything really. Right, and here we go. So let's see, let's see, let's see what's happening at the water hole today. Right. Well, it's nice to just grab a binoculars and give it a bit of a scan. Just soak up the view. busy as I hoped it to be. Jack, um, I've got absolutely no clue to be honest with you, but I will try and find out. But I think we probably look at about at its deepest point where it is now, probably about a meter and a half, I would guess. Uh, but I don't know what's happening below below the surface there, and. I mean, obviously, if this dam overflows, I mean, there's there's still another two meters or so at least to to the dam wall. So when it's filled up to the rim, it's probably much deeper than that. But I'm not entirely sure. I would like to then just chat to some of 
the staff at Juma that's been here for some time, or perhaps Steve will know. Um, but I would guess, for, as it, on its current level, about a meter and a half. I would guess, but I might be horribly wrong. It might be deeper. It might be a little less than that. Now there was always a couple of monitor lizards around there, and I'm trying to see if I cannot see them. I mean, yesterday we had the white throated leguan or rock monitor. I'm hoping to see the water leguan here. And while we are just scanning around with the camera, I'm just trying to see if I can't see them. In fact, let me quickly confirm something with my binoculars. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, boy. Okay, so they are there. Right, right at the that sort of corner of of the edge on the ground. Literally, there we go. Two of them. a bit of an interaction here between the two. There's definitely a bit of a standoff here. Hi Nancy. Yeah, and luckily I've got a very good quality pair of binoculars and that's something that I always advise guests who come to Africa to bring along. Uh, binoculars are definitely an essential tool out in the bush. It's probably more important for guides to use. And if it weren't for my binoculars, I would, there was no way that I would have spotted them. I mean, you can just look at that coloration, how they blend in. And they're not the largest of Lego ones or monitor lizards I've seen. They're both also roughly about 40 odd centimeters long. Now this particular one, the Nile monitor or water Lego one, they do grow much bigger than that. I've seen specimens of more than a meter in length. And as the name suggests, they do prefer a more aquatic or water environment. Hi, Joe. I'm not entirely sure, and it looks like they are basking in the sun at the moment, and I think it could be a case of, it could potentially be two males that you know, might not want to get too close to each other. There might be a female around that, remember this is now the start of the rainy season, so a lot of these things are starting to breed. So there's gonna be a lot of mating and courtship and so forth. And that might be one of the reasons. It might also be a female and a male, which uh, where the female might already have mated and possibly laid eggs and she's not in any mood for any other males at the time. Could be a young male that's not yet really ready to, to, to propagate these genes. 
Or it might be something as simple as, listen, I've got my spot in the sun, I've got a very good spot here and I'm heating up nicely and then come close and try and take my spot. So sometimes uh, the solution is a very simple one. You can clearly see the difference in size between the two. Quite a nice long one there. Owen just mentioned he can, you know, he can't even see them with the naked eye. And, and uh, now that I'm looking at that as well, which I've been on my binoculars just now, <laughs> I can also not see them with the naked eye. To give you an idea, what you see at this moment is more or less what we would have seen with the naked eye. And, and with the aid of binoculars, obviously, you can get a lot closer. And obviously, the camera does as well. Anyway, we'll sit here for a moment or two and then still continue elsewhere. As a naturalist, it's really important that I stay up to date and up to breast with what's happening in the wild and in the world around us. The Wild Earth app helps us do that and helps us stay abreast with the live interactions of animals every day. We're going to be here at Stony Point bringing you the African penguin story and we'd love to see you on the app. See you on the beach. The Mara Triangle is a jewel in the Kenyan conservation crown and thanks to the dedication of the Mara Conservancy, it thrives as one of Earth's greatest national treasures. We have been experiencing a reduction in the waste nets that uh, we collect on a monthly basis. And this is basically attributed to our intense patrols. Over the years, this courageous team of anti-poachers has reduced poaching to almost zero. I'm going to call Stephen Olereso. I've been doing this for a long time. 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 As a result of the global pandemic and the massive reduction in tourist revenue, the Mara Triangle is facing a financial crisis. They need your help if they are to continue their ability to protect this magical land. The croc is still holding another one there, stolen from the hindquarters. I would really want the wildebeest cross. Is it trying? The croc is holding the tail. It's holding tight. Oh no. Goodness me, lucky, lucky wildebeest. You have another day to leave. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth daily. I am an outdoor photographer, a wildlife filmmaker, and a conservation storyteller. Penguin Beach is going to offer us this really unique opportunity to watch and pick up on the smallest of details in the penguins' lives. It's going to allow us the time to really get to know these penguins well, get to know their story, and get to interpret the little finer details and share that with you with a live TV show and get you to fall in love with penguins. So we've left the water hole now, other than those monitor lizards, not much happening there. And I thought it might be a good idea to return to that hyena den. You know, it is rather warm, they might not be out. We just want to go make sure and you know, hopefully if we're lucky, ribbon will be present and 
I still maintain my theory that she is there and she is inside the den. And we didn't have any visual on her, just the cubs and obviously the others that was around there, Corky and her crew. So we're going to be heading there. And if we're lucky, we might, might, might have a glimpse. If we can confirm that she's there, then we are in business. It'll take us probably a good 10 or 15 minutes to get there. And like always, while in transit to these areas, we still keep out looking for anything that's, that's around us. Also, I just have to mention that again, you know, it's, it's just, we, it, it's just based on a feeling we've got, you know, that, that there might be something, you know, typical behavior of hyenas, remember they slightly more nocturnal and crepuscular than, than, uh, you know, most of the other things around here. So they, there's a lot of movement at night. It is getting warmer. So from a weather perspective, time of day perspective, it's very likely they'll be sleeping, but I'm literally throwing a rock into the bush and hoping for a bit of luck there. Well, having said that, you know, I've seen hyenas move around in midsummer, in midday. Uh, one of my mentors used to tell me that these animals don't read the same books that we do. So, I mean, our studies and textbooks that we study from and our experiences taught us, uh, this is what hyenas do this time of the day, but it's not etched in stone. It's, 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 it's dynamic. So let's hope it's dynamic today. Yes, I also hoping that that would be the case. It would be amazing if we could find it. If we don't, we know at least that the cubs for now are safe. And if something seriously would have happened to Ribbon, the chances are very good that those cubs would also have been uh, terminated. So that's a good sign for us at the moment. We're going to just head through a little drainage, so just excuse us if you do lose us for a second. We will be back just after that. As you might have known watching the show, we do lose a bit of connectivity in these drainages. The sun is getting nice, nice and hot now. I can feel, should probably top up on some sunscreen. <laughs> So, so just to give us time to get in there and assess the situation, uh, we're going to send you over to Mike on his bushwalk. So 
We were sitting watching the dam now and we realized that elephants have have been feasting on the roots over here of whatever this was. I mean, I guess it was probably a knob thorn. It's quite interesting. We've, we've always sat at the same spot whenever we're at the dam, you know, trying to just catch some behavior. And it's quite interesting, you know, the, the season is getting quite green now. There's plenty of grass growing, there's lots of leaves, but elephants are still seeming to need something from these roots. You can see they've probably been using their tusks, digging up the dirt all around here, and then digging up these big fat roots, looking for the cambium just underneath the layer. I and mean, this is still very wet and soft. So there's lots of nutrients in here. It's a bit like a, like a very tough carrot. I was just saying it's a bit like sugar cane to an elephant, I think. They just chew on it and they spit out the fibers. All they want is the juice, the, the, the nutritious substance. So I've actually got a piece over here, which has literally been in an elephant's mouth, chewed up all the, the moisture and nutrients are out. It's still quite supple. This was probably from last night. Still quite supple, but you can see this is what they did not want. They just spat out all these fibers. And this is actually not great for an elephant's long-term health. Short term, yes, they get nutrients and energy from these roots, but long term, this stuff is tough. And the more they chew on this kind of stuff, the more they damage their teeth. And the, you know, elephants only have a set number of teeth in their life. And once those teeth are degraded enough, they, uh, they never grow more. And so elephants in this part of Southern Africa, which goes through a very, very strong dry season, very strong, very long dry season, they have to eat a lot of this kind of stuff. So elephants in this part of the world don't usually grow much more than about 50 years old, maybe 55, because their teeth get damaged at quite a young age. There are other parts of Africa, like um, the Ngorogoro Crater, I think that's in Tanzania, where there's lots of water, it's wet, there's lots of reeds, there's plenty of fresh material all the time, and they live much longer, maybe up to 65 years old. So they don't have to eat this stuff. Now another thing I noticed, which was quite interesting, is that you know, these roots are quite woody and hard. This is not the part which is absorbing the nutrients. This is the part that's sending the nutrients up the tree. But just over here, you can actually see the fine, thin filaments of the roots. That's what's actually absorbing the nutrients and the minerals from under the ground and bringing them into the tree itself. And this has actually already been damaged. This is very soft but it's already been damaged. This should have lots of tiny little hairs. In fact, you can see one of those little hairs right over there, just waving around in the wind. When I blow, you can actually see it a little bit more. That is what it's absorbing. Such a thin, tiny filament like that. That's why when you transplant trees and plants, the best time to do it is just at the beginning of the growing season or even at the latest, latest part of winter because all the trees are storing the energy in these root masses. So when you try and transplant them and all these very fine filaments get damaged, uh, the tree has got the nutrients in here stored to be able to regrow these. If you try and transplant a, a plant, a flower, a bush, whatever, in the middle of summer, when it's putting out all that green leafy material, what tends to happen is they die because they don't have enough support to draw the nutrients up into the tree and keep it growing. So remember that next time you want to transplant some plants and so make sure that it stays very wet when you transplant anything in order for these filaments to start growing again. They can't grow in dry soil. It's very important that you get that just right. Very interesting to see. Now, only visible now because the elephants pulled this out. So this is, this is the part that was under the ground. You can see lots of dirt covering it. And this part was exposed. So it's even got leaves growing on it. So even the root part of trees can sometimes grow leaves from it as long as it's exposed to the sunlight and the air that's how trees are able to survive very hectic elephant damage wild earth turned 14 this year and as many of you know we have created a beautiful coffee table book to celebrate our history so far the book is made up of memorable animal sightings from the last 14 years as chosen by Wild Earth viewers from all over the world. And now, we're finally ready to go to print. But before we do, 
we're opening sales again for a very short time for those people who still want to buy this little piece of Wild Earth history. Head over to our website to buy your copy. Once again, thank you to all those who have contributed to make this, we think quite possibly, the best coffee table book ever made. If you love to watch Wild Earth, then we are inviting you to join our Explorers program. For a monthly subscription, you will have the opportunity to win fantastic Wild Earth expeditions, join our guides for a chat around the fire, receive weekly highlights from our shows, and much more. All the money will go to keeping these live safaris on air, which in turn allows us to escape into nature every single day. Hello, Mama. Just checking us out, everybody. There's no aggression here. Very relaxed. A herd of elephants moving around your car like that is truly, truly magical. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. My name is Steve and one of my favorite things at Wild Earth is getting questions from you. The type of questions that I really like are those ones that really help us to unpack and understand and really integrate the ecological knowledge and fully appreciate the importance that animals such as these Cape Buffalo bring to the ecosystem. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, you're going to have to register on the website. But once registered, just head on over to the live safari page and enter your question under the live feed. down the Gary Right, so we have arrived and there is no movement at the moment. It doesn't mean that's a bad thing. Um, like I mentioned en route here, yeah, that in this time of day they are likely to be inside the den. We did see them this morning, the youngsters, the cubs, and my suspicion is still that Ribbon is inside there. And we will just wait out a little bit, but again, like I said, time of day, probably not gonna come out. We just wanted to take a chance more. So I'm really hoping that they would be here. And very typical of Ahina that uh, in this area, to use old termite mounds as den sites. But yeah, it is rather warm already, so my guess is that they're not gonna come out until it's probably very late in the afternoon. Hi, Andrea. I have not yet met Mrs. Wig. We did drive the area there earlier this morning and we didn't have any visual of her. And I would certainly in the next coming days try and, and see if I can't get acquainted with her. And in fact, since there's no movement here, I think that might actually be a good idea to 
go and see if she's she's up at the nest. Why not? Let's go and do that. Right, so yeah. I think let's leave the den. We've been here this morning. We have established that at least two of the cubs are alive. And since Andrea mentioned, if I've met Mrs. Wig, and I haven't actually, no better opportunity than now to go and to go and see if she is around. Well, while we are going to the nesting site, uh, we're gonna head over to Steve, who's at Chitwa, Chitwa Dam. Not sure if you can uh, copy us, but we are not getting any comms, and uh, cell phone signal isn't working here. So if you do copy us out there in the real world, we're going to uh, start up again and move on because it seems like something is not working. Okay, so we are still live. We're going to move on out. I don't know what's happening this morning. Normally we get quite good communications here. So if you've been asking me questions there, I can't hear you. <laughs> Thanks Chitu, it's been real. Quite an experience. I've had some incredible sightings on Chitu. I've had uh, Wild dogs are in interaction. I've had wild dogs killing um, a water buck. I've had a live buffalo birth. Tristan's had hippos killing hippos. And James has had crocodiles catching impala that have been chased into the water by wild dogs. And it is a place that anything can happen. So I do enjoy our little sojourns through to Chitwa. of silk all over there it almost looks like it's trying to hold that log together but there's probably just a little hidey hole that it's put in lots of silk strands probably acting as an alarm system not only for any predators or intruders that might arrive but also to catch to catch to capture any prey that might wander too closely i can see at least one of its legs the front left leg the closest one to us is raised up, just touching one of those silk strands gently, so it could feel the vibrations of anything that crawls over it. May it be a fly, or a beetle, or caterpillar, whatever it might be. This spider itself, I'm not sure what it is. It's very fluffy, though. It kind of has a look like a, like a wall spider, or like a flat bark spider of some sort, but I've never seen one quite so fuzzy like that. It's got forward-facing eyes, so it's a hunting spider. Really has these like eyes on little humps on its on its cephalothorax. Facing forward, and I think it's a male because it's got quite well-developed pedipalps. Now pedipalps are modified mouth parts that the males use for sexual reproduction. 
and they're just tucked under the, the front of the head there, just behind, or rather just in front of the, the first pair of legs. And the females have a very, very reduced set of pedipalps. They're mostly just used for feeding or for picking up chemical signals, whereas the males actually have usually quite bulbous ends to their pedipalps. And what they'll often do is they'll literally just like insert those into the epigynum of a female, and that way they can transfer their reproductive materials. Quite, quite different to another arachnid, which is the scorpions. Scorpions literally use their pedipalps, which are those pincers, that are modified even further into pincers, and they lift up the female. The male will leave a sperm packet on the ground, and they'll actually grab the female and lift her up off the ground, often after stinging her to subdue her, and then place her directly upon the sperm packet, which will then allow her to be inseminated. And then, uh, then yeah, I don't know what he does after that, probably just, just kind of continues on his merry way. Some spiders have a little bit of parental care, but scorpions, many scorpions have an amazing amount of parental care. These spiders usually just lay eggs, protect the egg sac, and then once the eggs hatch, the baby spiders are on their own after the first few days. They'll kite their way off, they'll release strings of silk, and then once the silk gets enough drag on the wind, they'll fly off and colonize a new area. Um, but scorpions will literally have the babies on their backs and carry them around for the first few weeks and that is in order to not keep them from being eaten, but also to regulate their body's moisture levels. So if they dry out, they'll obviously die. The female is able to regulate their moisture by allowing them to sit on her back. Very interesting looking spider, I'm trying to see. Now, all of its legs actually on the one side are touching the silk. So it's really able to feel any of the vibrations. I wonder if I took a small piece of grass, a very thin, light piece of grass, how it would react to something just touching. No reaction at all, it knows. It knows the difference between a grass and an insect, even if I wiggle it. Well, I mean, I'm doing it right in front of its face, so it's probably, you can see the grass. Oh, it's very strong silk, though. Oh, did you, that gave me a huge fright. <laughs> did you get that? <laughs> oh my goodness, that gave me a huge fright. So you see, when I then put the grass behind it so it could not see what was it, it, like bothering the silk, it quickly turned around and struck at the end of the grass, realized it wasn't a prey, and then left it alone. That was incredibly fast, like lightning. Let's see if it'll do it again. No, once bitten, twice shy won't fall for the same trick twice. That was really cool. It was immediate. As soon as the grass touched the back strands of that silk, it just jumped forward. That was so cool. Well, that gave me a fright. I need to go and let my adrenaline levels go down again. And we'll send you over to Chris whilst I calm down. There we go, the famous Mrs. Wig. So now I've finally seen her as well for the first time. Thanks to Andrea, who was asking if I did meet her, and now I have. And She's looking straight at us now. I'm on my binoculars here because so I'm going to try and see. Because it looks like that chick is there under her left wing. You can see a little fluffy white little ball sticking out there. Well, I've never seen such a calm eagle owl this place yeah, she's getting quite warm you can see how she's dealing that guttural fluttering trying to 
to cool herself down a bit. I think they've got the most amazing eyes. Those beautiful, beautiful yellow eyes with that black pupil. Hi, my Kisha. Yes, it is incredible. And that's one of my favorite birds as well. The spotted eagle owl. And not only that, meeting one of one of our most loved characters here. And for me, the value is to be able to see this owl in daytime, this calm, and clearly not faced by us. It would be good if I can see the chick. I believe it's called Twiglet. <laughs> But at the moment she's, she's covering it, and that's not because of our presence. Close, I can truly appreciate all those colors and patterns on the feathers and the face. And it's not often, I would say, in normal circumstances where you get this close to this particular species, especially in daytime. Definitely very warm at the moment. And just, I must say that uh, Darren and I are also feeling very similar. It is getting rather warm at the moment. The sun is starting to really hammer down on us now. She's got a bit of shade. So I love nature and I love being immersed in the natural world. And one of my favorite things is watching what my mates at Wild Earth get up to on their safari. This is crazy. And if you want to join us in our penguin adventures, get on the Wild Earth app and immerse yourself into the cute, adorable world of these little animals. With a slew of potential dangers lurking, it's essential to be aware of your surroundings whilst walking in the wilderness. away from one of the most endangered species. This is a big bull. What a moment, what a close encounter with an Ellie bull. He's just over here now. He's moved completely away. Being on a bushwalk and seeing a leopard, I mean, it's ridiculous to be this close to a leopard on foot and for him not to run is absolutely insane. How crazy was that? Through the gap there is just the back of the head of a male lion. He is absolutely unaware that we are here right now. I tell you, seeing lions on foot, is, it, it, it definitely brings out the caveman in you, this little scared human being. Um, something very, very interesting. I didn't plan this, but this is a scene, uh, rarely seen. This is 
what we call a journey of giraffe. So beautiful. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. Hello everyone, my name is Trishala and I am a naturalist and safari guide here in Juma Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands in South Africa. I think that the information that we provide and most importantly the questions that you ask give both you and I a really good idea of what's going on. My friend Fernando here, he's a flat-necked chameleon and I love them. They're just these gems that you manage to find in the bush. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. It seems like uh, Triglet has moved a little bit there. <laughs> just sort of probably just repositioned a little bit. It would be so nice if we can see the chick. And those of you who have seen them before, <laughs> if you've seen owl chicks, they don't really look like the finished product just yet. Quite a lot of bird sounds around in this drainage, other than her. Hi Jimmy, who asks, won't the check overheat? Um, not really. Uh, even though the ambient temperature is rather warm, um, bear in mind, especially with birds, uh, their normal body temperature is slightly higher than ours. You know, they run in about 38, um, 39 ish. Um, so their normal temperature is warmer, so they do have to operate at a slightly warmer temperature than us. But um, if you look at any baby animal, uh, warm-blooded creature-wise, um, you know, even now human babies, if you think about it, um, generally are not that efficient yet to regulate their body temperature, whether it is to heat up or to cool down. And the parents often have to assist with that, and that's what's happening here. Um, it's just sort of, firstly, it's covering it as well. Remember that check is also sort of a grey whitish colour. So it is a contrasting colour, so it will be a lot more visible if it's not covered. And then also the mud is assisting to keep it warm. So it's dual purpose, it's for its own safety as well. Laura Moore. Yeah, that's exactly going back to the previous question as well. If you look at um, those of you who've seen the chick again, the chick has got this white grayish color, it will stand out like a sore thumb. And she is very, very well camouflaged. I think, you know, it's, it's, and it's so clearly visible. And in time, the chick will also develop its adult plumage and it will be the same. It'll take a while though. <clears throat> and not only the patterns on the wings, I mean, even the pattern on the face and the so called ears, which are just mere feathers that breaks 
the facial outline, make it merge with its background. The ears are actually on the side of the face. But yes, indeed, very, very well camouflaged. I mean, when we stopped here, Darren was already on camera and I was still struggling to find it. I mean, where I'm sitting here with a naked eye, it's, if, if you don't know exactly where she is, you would drive right past her. You would not know that she's there. Or unless she moves. We thinking of moving on. Look at that, it's amazing. Five, four, three, two, one, live, live. Oh, that's cool. Just in there. And the black mob is going up the tree and the mongoose is attacking it. She's gonna pounce again. <laughs> I'm sure you can all agree with me. It's not a bad start to our Wednesday morning. Something that I have never seen before in my entire life that you are now watching live. Look at that. It's just beautiful. Fantastic display by a little herd of springbuck. How is this view? My heart is in my mouth, everybody. Amazing, they've locked their tusks together. You can hear the cracking crunches. <laughs> It is so incredible to spend this time so close to an African penguin and it's completely unfazed by my presence whatsoever. How insane is that animal? Amazing. Fantastic to watch. Now we've got a tug of war between mom and daughter. Look. I'm just at a loss for words. Yeah. I mean, that's just incredible to see that. Look what we found. We're on our way back towards the HQ to close down for the morning. And we just came across a beautiful Warburg's eagle sitting in my favorite tree, Leadwood. And it's, it's, it's just caught something and I can't tell what it is. It's either like a juvenile crested Franklin or it's a female Cokie Franklin. That is so unbelievably cool. It's just plucked off all of its feathers 
and now it is about to fly off. There it goes. Wow, that was so cool. So we're in the car, so it's going to be weird seeing me sitting in the car after a, a bushwalk, but that was absolutely unbelievable. Right in the tree above us. As we drove past here, we saw the what looked like a forktail jungle attacking something, and as we stopped right in the tree, literally about like five meters away from us, was this was this uh, was this Wahlberg's eagle. It was the most amazing thing I've seen the whole morning. I mean, apart from the no, that was definitely the most amazing thing. Sitting right up there, I'd love to be able to know exactly what bird it was feasting on, but it looked very much like either a young crested Franklin or a Cokie Franklin, which is quite unusually rare. Well, that was a wonderful way to end the bushwalk this morning, but Chris is still out there, so we'll send you over to him. hope Mike enjoys his breakfast. We are soon going to follow suit. Just uh, having a last little look at Mrs. Wigger and listening to all these lovely bird sounds around here. I can tell you one thing. I think we're in for a very, very warm afternoon probably quite hot, which could be a good thing. You know, it might prompt animals to move to water holes and maybe quite a number of elephants, we never know. Well, I was hoping to see the chick and yes, it is quite warm. Mother's shading it, hiding it, so I'm sure in the next coming days that I would be able to see it. And I hope that you could join me for that. We just had a little bit of a scare just now. Uh, <laughs> not something serious now, but there was two Wahlberg eagles that came very low level. And she immediately looked up, and um, I don't think they were looking for her. And they just sort of circled and circled further and further away. Even with their very good eyesight, they would not have seen her from where they were. One thing I've not yet seen is a spotted eagle something. And that's normally something at night. But anyway, that was lovely to meet you, Mrs. Wig. And I'm sure we'll see each other again in the next couple of weeks. And hopefully you can show us the little one a little clearer. <laughs> well, that was a delightful morning. And the cats have eluded us again. But we will definitely try again this afternoon and see what comes up. So thank you for joining me live on this safari and join us again this afternoon and we are going to be heading over to Penguin Beach after the safari.